met with the president a couple times. I've um, met with, with her numerous times. We've covered them in prayer before. And just to see that we have, you know, this is an eye opener for me, Sean. Um, people are people, whether they be in power, whether they be in the king's palace, whether they be out, you know, in the slums, whether they be in their nine to five job, people are people. I, I really understand that at the end of the day, we are really needy of the grace of God. It's yep. very hard for us to, to judge. I, I, I'm, I'm a, a, you know, I, I, I am guilty of being somebody that judges quick. And uh, but once I've been pulled into those meetings in the presidential palace and to see and hear them and at times even the president weeping before me and, and offering, you know, we're offering prayer and uh, and seeing this this man is just as much human as I am. And we're in the need of grace and uh, in need of wisdom. And I'll just leave this, you know, as we continue. Um, one of the key things that I've found, and this is going to sound a little bit odd, but I mean, you all understand what I'm trying to say is that. Hey, everyone, welcome again to another Supernatural Leadership Podcast episode. My name is Sean Gaby. Thank you so much for stopping by. We're so thankful that you are a part of the Supernatural Leadership Podcast family with us. Please don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, share these episodes with your friends. I know that so many leaders out there are hungry in this season, especially this season, to grow more in the supernatural and actually leave a powerful impact in the marketplace. And so as you've heard, we've been adding more and more bonus episodes throughout the month. We're not just coming at you on the first Wednesday of every month anymore. We're bringing in guests now talking about how they are impacting the world around them in hopes that it encourages you to take your leadership and make it a little more supernatural. Today, we have an incredible opportunity to have a chat with a good friend of mine, Tiaflo Hayashi, who's based out of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And he is the founder of Dunamis Movement, a revival-focused campus ministry with chapters in over 400 universities in the nations. Dunamis also holds conferences across the globe and through their multiple training schools, equipping students to become marketplace leaders that carry kingdom influence in society. Diofalo has traveled over 40 nations preaching the gospel and seeing the miraculous power of God touch people from all walks of life. Him and his wife, Junia, besides leading Dunamis, are the senior leaders of Zion Church, a thriving multi-site church that is impacting not only the metropolis of Sao Paulo, Brazil, but different cities around the globe. He also holds degrees in psychology and theology and has authored several uh, books and as a part of the collab that leads the send, which is a global initiative that mobilizes youth to embrace the missional lifestyle. Teofilo and Junia have three boys, Zach Koa, and actually the third is on the way, Benny coming real soon in July. And they live, like I said, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I want to just welcome you, man, Teofilo. So good to have you on this podcast. Hey, Sean, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm just grateful for our friendship and uh, for getting to build kingdom with you, and Michelle, and and uh, the ministry out there in Ottawa, kingdom culture. It's just been good. I mean, we I've been thinking about this. We've been running together on this as family uh, for close to a decade now. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, because we met back in 2000, I think 12, right, in L.A. 2012, so it's like nine years, almost a decade of uh, getting to know you, uh, what God's doing through you guys out in Canada, in the nations. And uh, it's just been such encouragement to just come alongside you guys as well. That's amazing. Well, we love you guys. You guys inspire us. And you're in Hawaii right now yeah. on a yeah. one-year sabbatical, Not living the dream, home. man, during this pandemic. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we, we uh, have this rhythm. We go hard. I mean, super hard for seven years, and then we rest a full year. It's amazing. And it's just been good on the on the marriage, the kids, you know, the family life, even our uh, just to uh, Juni and I get to focus a little bit more on our studies and just, you know, look inwards because, you know, most of the most of the time during those seven years, we're looking outwards. Uh, and, and I used to be uh, out here in Kona back in the day. So um, Kona, Hawaii. So I'm back here now uh, just alongside friends. 
uh, ministries out here. And uh, it's amazing to see what God's doing in Hawaii as well. That's amazing, man. You know, I, I'm super excited to have this chat with you today because you really, for those of you that are listening, I don't know uh, Teo, which is short for Teofilo. Uh, he really is a man who influences the marketplace in really powerful ways. Reformation. I mean, he leads a whole movement that's impacting not only the nation of Brazil, but the nations around the world and specifically in like many areas of culture, business, media, uh, politically, governmentally. And, you know, I remember, man, like when we first connected, I know we were, we met in 2012, we first connected. I remember we had ice cream on the strip in Pasadena and we were just chatting. I think we were getting to know my wife and your wife were bonding. We were hanging out. And I just remember thinking to myself, man, this guy, this couple is going to change the world. Just sitting with you, knowing this guy and his wife just have incredible, incredible purpose and destiny on their life. And honestly, man, like nine years later, like I've I've had the privilege of observing and absorbing, watching what God is doing through your lives and the ministries and the endeavors and the initiatives that you're a part of. And it literally is changing the world. And you're, you're obviously changing the world through people transformation, which is what the kingdom's all about. Right. And so it's incredible to watch, man. And I feel so privileged to be able to be a small part and experience a small part of that alongside with you. And so today I want to dive into it, man, because, you know, I, I believe that you are a guy and a leader that is, is, you know, you, you are what you preach, you are what you say, and you're living it out. And I want to draw from you a little bit of your journey into, you know, you, you were in, you were in the church. Yeah. You know, you uh, had an encounter at some point, which changed your life with Jesus. You knew that he was real, yeah. changed your leadership from just being a good leader to a supernatural leader, which is the premise of this whole yes. podcast. And yes. then, you know, you, you're, you're, you're in the church, you're doing all these things. And then you start to see the value now of how do we bring kingdom? How do we bring yeah. supernatural leadership into the marketplace? I know you're yeah. involved in, you know, influencing the sports domain. Soccer is a big deal in yeah. Brazil. You're, yeah. you're, you're, you're influencing the political climate in Brazil. You're influencing media in radical ways, man. I mean, when I was with you yeah. in February of 2020, you guys did the send. It was like, what, 150,000 people yeah. gathering you know, three stadiums, the largest multi-site stadium gathering of all time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and like, just, it was like headlines everywhere. I mean, you guys, yeah. it was amazing. And so like, give me a little bit, give us a little bit of a snapshot of how you transitioned and some of the things that you first started to see in your journey that made you realize, wow, this is why we need to bring the supernatural into the marketplace in our leadership. Yeah. Well, for sure, man. I mean, I, uh, you, you know my story, but for people that are listening to me that don't know my story, basically, you know, I, I am half Japanese, I'm, I'm half Italian, born and raised in Brazil, spent part of my childhood in Europe, uh, was educated in America, and, uh, you know, I, I, I always, I say to people, the Lord kind of uh, placed me in a place that I had to, to see the nations, you know, I, it, it, I just kind of grew up with this feeling like I never fit in. And uh, whether in Brazil, whether in the Japanese community, whether when I went to visit Japan for the first time, and I felt like I'd be welcome, and suddenly I just felt like a stranger. Uh, I remember even coming to America, uh, you know, it, it, it was like in hearing for the first time in my life that I was a minority. So, so you know, it, it's this kind of thing like, Lord, where do I fit in? You know, where, where do I fit in? And I felt the Lord, uh, you know, I had a supernatural encounter with the Lord inside a club when I was in college, uh, not living for Jesus, uh, just kind of cold on my, you know, on my spiritual walk and just going crazy out there and doing college stuff, you know, and I, the Lord just supernaturally reached in inside a club and, and convicted me of what I was doing. I had a, I had a, a uh, I call him my road to Damascus was inside a club moment and, and uh, it was totally, you know, a revolution. So I walk out of there and um, I hear the Holy Spirit speak to my heart. I mean, and, and it's very hard for me to explain this because it's not very empirical the way that I will, will explain it. But I heard a voice inside my chest and people will ask me, is it, was it audible? I said, it wasn't audible, but I heard it. Right. And, and, uh, and it said, why wham? 
It's crazy. I had never heard of YWAM before in my life. Right after I put my foot outside of that club in Tampa, Florida, and um, which then three hours later, I find myself in front of a computer Googling YWAM, this thing that I just heard. And I, and I land on their website and find out it's actual mission uh, that, that prepares young people to do missions. And so I sign up. I end up, uh, you know, wild stopping uh, my education for a season to be trained with YWAM, start going to the nations and really find this uh, home when I'm in movement, right? So remember, I said, like, I, I just couldn't fit in. And so I kind of feel like as long as I'm moving, you know, hopping from nation to nation, seeing God move, I kind of feel like I'm fitting in, right? And, and it took me a while to understand that that's kind of how God wired me. And um, I remember just a season in India. This is maybe three years into my missionary, quote unquote, career. I'm evangelizing these, these buddies of mine. I've always played soccer my whole life. And so I'm out there in this university out in India, uh, Jamia Milia University, the biggest Muslim university in the world is in New Delhi. I'm playing soccer with these guys. I uh, develop friendship. I'm trying to evangelize. And basically what they're telling me is, listen, you have your Christian faith. We have our Muslim faith. They, they were Muslims. They were at the, uh, the Muslim quarters of New Delhi. They spoke Urdu and uh, not Hindi. And, and they said, um, listen, you stick with your faith. I stick with my faith and we can be friends. Right. And I was just so frustrated because I'm thinking, Lord, this is not working. I mean, and, and uh, I wasn't that, you know, trained to go the apologetics route. And I, I remember somebody gave me a book, actually two books. One was God Chasers by Tommy Tenney. Love that. And book. the other one, the other one was Evangelism by Fire by uh, Reinhard Bonnke. And those books, man, they lit me up and just took me into a season where my rationale was, if I could get these people to experience the supernatural power of God, whether it be through the prophetic, whether it be through a healing whether it be a miracle or a creative miracle, how could they deny that my God is the true God, right? I, I need to take them not into an intellectual rationale, although, although there is room and space, and that is important. But in my thinking, it was, I, 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 I need to get them into a supernatural experience. How can I be a carrier of the supernatural experience? Which, which then put me on a journey that made me take up a position out in North Carolina as my, uh, uh, at, at an at a African-American church, as my uh, spiritual dad, who was the senior leader of that church, really was a prophetic voice and, and, and um, you know, a prophetic leader just took me under his wings and just provided me with training. Now, the, the thing about it was, I was actually going to take over that, you know, or, or stay there and live the American dream and and do church stuff. And, you know, it was just kind of things were setting up for me. And the Lord, I remember one time I had these opportunities in front of me, even citizenship in America. And I, um, I remember praying and fasting and the Holy Spirit came with a question and he asked me, are you going after the kingdom dream or the American dream? Right. And so yeah, I was like, difference. wow, this is, this is kind of like th something off of my mind. But the more I prayed, I would hear the same question. Are you going after the kingdom dream or the American dream? And when I started to say, Lord, I want to go after the kingdom dream, but I've always thought that I was going after the kingdom dream. I felt the Lord say, well, tell these people that you're not going to stay here. Tell them that you're not going to take any of the, the opportunities they're giving you. You're not going to become a citizen. Uh, you're, you're actually to move back to Brazil. And I'm like, why, what would, wow. I mean, why would I move back to Brazil? Brazil has mega churches. Brazil is, I mean, it, it's, it's very evangelized. Um, and I felt the Lord say Brazil has quantity, but we need, uh, leaders that will actually change and reform nations. You know, I've, I've always, I had always preached and been kind of like this you know, it, it was kind of like this cliche thing that I would say, you know, a true revival will culminate in social transformation, right? And so, uh, and then somebody would actually ask me, well, what is uh, a social transformation? How do we measure 
social transformation? And then I would answer, you know, it's the eradication of systemic poverty. Um, and so now it, it was kind of like my feet were up to the fire and the Lord was saying, will you move back and uh, raise up the future leaders of the nation? Because we have a huge, huge, you know, Christian church in Brazil, but what's, what's going on with the corruption? I mean, what's going on with the, with, with the crime rates? Uh, wh what about the, the, the social injustices, uh, uh, pedophilia, human trafficking? I mean, I, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And I'm like, wow, Lord, so, so how does this happen? You know, I, I remember one of my um, heroes in the faith, Bill Bright, he would say, if we conquer the campuses today, we will conquer society tomorrow, right? Wow. And so uh, I'm thinking, I need to go into the universities. You know, that's kind of how Dunamis was birthed. You know, I, I moved back 2008, flew back to Brazil um, to pretty much start from scratch. You know, giving up, uh, the, you know, a pathway. The to American city. dream. Yeah, gave, yeah, literally, you know, it's like no job offers, no ministry offers anymore. Had said no to all of them. Uh, book offers, you know, the whole the, the whole ministry thing in, in America. Uh, citizenship, give that up and, and move back to Brazil and uh, start from scratch and go into one university. And I, people ask me, how did Dunamis begin? And I, I, I tell people, I went to one university with two other guys that I started discipling, which became people that co-led the movement with me. Um, but we would just pray in, in the spirit, walk, like prayer walk, the university campus, pray in the spirit until we had so much faith, ask for prophetic words, go on a treasure hunt, heal a couple people, uh, you know, just give out words of knowledge. And soon we had like, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 people around us and then just give them the message of salvation. Uh, some of them were like, yeah, whatever. I heard, I heard you guys are Christians. And they will walk away. But a, a lot of people would just stay, stay, stay there and be like, I, I want more of this. And I would say, well, if you want more spiritual reading, I'll be back here next week. And then suddenly we were going back there week after week after week. And then I'm like, we need to structure this. And then it became a, like a, a Bible club in there where we would uh, do Bible studies, worship, and pray for the sick, and and just minister to each other, and um, and we had to structure things, and and then, then we started leading them into training, uh, so that it was student led. But the thing was, we were reaching the brightest minds of the nation. We went to the, like the hardest campuses, the prestigious universities, and uh, now guess what? These guys that were impacted you know, more than a decade ago by dunamis inside their campuses, they're in strategic positions right now in the marketplace. And uh, a lot of them are continuing carrying the kingdom DNA. So, so that's kind of like the backdrop of how we start, started to see a move of God, which is still in the inception. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a long process, but we, we are seeing already uh, the, the, the effects of people that are walking in this in society as marketplace leaders it's amazing it, so you know now you're in 400 universities and yeah. around brazil not just local sao paulo but around brazil and you're seeing incredible incredible things happen now like actually john it, it's beyond brazil we we've we've seen um you know this kind of was when i went across the border to chile to argentina to wow. uh Uruguay. Uh, we have uh chapters of dunamis in europe a lot of them in europe in portugal and spain and italy even in russia wow. at, at a certain point we we uh we had him uh in three or four universities in colorado in america uh and and so uh of course biggest concentration is in latin america and in europe but uh, we're we're believing the lord will open the door for us to continue that into north america amazing, as well. amazing. so you know here you are you're you're obviously impacting the world around you through your investment into all of these universities, all of these people that you're invested in training and equipping, bring me into a little bit of your personal advance and journey in like stories, kind of like Daniel, you know, one of the, one of the, the characters I love to talk about, and especially like really the premise of this podcast is Daniel wasn't just a good man wasn't just faithful, wasn't just integral. He was all those things. 
but he was a man of the supernatural. And one of the reasons why Daniel was so promoted was because of things that in, revolved around the supernatural, whether it was interpreting a dream, whether it was, you know, saying no to compromise and therefore supernaturally delivered from a lion's den. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, this guy's legit. He's not willing to compromise. I mean, this clearly he knows the God of gods, you know? So Daniel was really like an example of this. Give me, bring us into like a, a, a powerful story where you maybe had an opportunity or a door to, to influence an influencer and yeah. see, see transformation. And then, and then give us some of like the tools. So those that are listening, okay, how did you come about that? How did you position yourself while you're in it? Cause it's one thing to share a story, but then I want to know, people want to know what are the nuts and bolts of how you were able to, to maneuver and step into the fruit of that story. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we talk about, we want to reach nations. We talk about the great commission and in, in, in Matthew 28 and his discipling nations. And, you know, I, I really am a firm believer. You will not disciple a nation if all you do is within the four walls of the church. I mean, that is only one sphere of what comprises society. Society is comprised of more than just church. You have the education sphere. You have, you know, the family sphere. You have the business sphere, the the, the government sphere. And, and usually what we call, you know, the power spheres are are money and government. So it's it's the economics, it's the 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 politics, uh, and although those are very important to reach, I would say you know you can see immediate change. Uh, this is what I tell my guys. I say you know my team. I say we can see immediate change reaching government and reaching the business sphere, but we will see long standing fruit and long standing change when we reach family, when we reach education. And when we reach celebration, what is celebration? I'm talking about uh, arts, entertainment, and sports. And, and many people don't realize how strong that sphere is because you don't watch a movie because you're forced to watch a movie. You want to watch a movie. You, yeah. want, to, you, you want to go into, a, I don't know, a, a Netflix series or, or, or whatever you're, you know, watching with your wife every night, you know, an episode a night. You want to watch your your favorite soccer game, uh, soccer team play that game or your NBA team play that game, you know, you want to. It, you, nobody forces you to sit in front of your TV and watch the playoffs. I mean, but you are forced to go through educational system. You are forced to pay taxes. Uh, in, in my country, not in America, I don't know how it is in Canada, but in my country, you are forced to vote. It's a mandatory thing or else you pay a fine. So to a certain degree, um, politics, um, education, I'm talking about business, the, the economic world, they, they are they're mandatory upon us as citizens of the nations we represent. However, celebration is, is a choice. And, and if you look at the secular agenda, the secular agenda understood that if we are to change a nation or change a culture, we're going to go in through the schools, we're going to go in through the redefinition of a family. We're going to go into the arts and entertainment. And, and, uh, and you don't see those fruits immediately. But over the course of two decades, three decades, yeah. you have your kids thinking differently than you think. You have your grandkids uh, you know, absorbing a new normal that for you was totally abnormal. For them, it's totally normal, right? Because it was part of this, this, this you know, uh, long-term plan. However, I feel that we, as the church, as the body of Christ, we need to understand. We we need to hit the we need to hit the power spheres, but we also need to hit the long standing spheres. And, and, and when we we see, you know, what let's say I'll take Brazil for an for an example. We were seen in 2013. I remember this. We had this very spontaneous, popular upheaval, where. Kids, young people just went out to the streets and they said, we, we've had enough of corruption, right? And uh, they'll call that back in Brazil, the, the, 2013, the June 2013 manifestations. I'm talking, uh, I'm, I'm talking millions, millions of young people on the streets with Brazil jerseys, soccer jerseys, yellow jerseys, just, you know, just protesting, saying we, we want the end of corruption. Well, that sparked up a lot of different, uh, you know, leaders, 
So this is the era of the internet, the information era. People are blogging, people are vlogging, people are have their YouTube channels. And I mean, this thing is picking up. Well, it culminates five years later to the elections, the presidential elections, to, to this guy that uh, really you would never, people had never given him you know, any thought of this guy actually has a chance of becoming the president. His name is Bolsonaro. Now, I know the media paints him as a very negative person. And um, of course, he's not perfect. But when he came up, he came on the scene as a presidential uh, candidate, he was actually preaching um, or defending uh, moral values. Uh, he was actually saying, I'm going to eradicate corruption. And uh, the church came behind him. Right. And, and uh, if you ask me at the time, it just made sense. It was a situation where it just made sense to to vote for him, although he would could be a little bit crude, could be a little foolish in the way he spoke, uh, lacked a little bit of tact, not a little, a lot of tact. And uh, but at the same time, he was defending the values that we see as biblical values. Now, on the other side, on the other side, you had people that had been in power already for 14 years and they were actually taking us further and further away from what we knew as conservative values. So it was a no brainer. So we voted this guy in and, you know, Brazil as, as a, as a whole, a big support to this, uh, to this president he became our president Bolsonaro. He has been in office in two years. If you ask me, what do you think of his, you know, so far, I would say, you know, he, he, picked, he was actually, you know, elected to, to lead the nation in during a pandemic. I mean, it's, it's challenging for any leader. Absolutely. And uh, of course he's not perfect. I disagree with a lot of things that he says, but what I can appreciate is the openness that he has to hear from faith leaders. Now, whether these faith leaders come with pure intentions or not, right. I'm not here to judge them, but that opened up a lot of doors even for myself. And so I've, I've, I've had meetings with him. And uh, I've actually uh, seen the his side and uh, uh, of asking for prayer and saying, listen, hey, I'm just trying to do good. I uh, I've never realized how hard it was to become a president. It, it's so hard to actually, you know, fight the establishment and everything that that comes against the values that I believe uh, he would he would actually say, you know, I, a lot of times I don't say things the best way, but um, he is open for prayer. And so uh, recently, uh, we he actually reached out through to one of our uh, young guys that, that we, we have a, a group of young apostolic church leaders, uh, most actually everybody under 40. And uh, these are guys that are leading, I would say, the future church of Brazil. And his office, his cabinet said, if you guys want to come and have, you know, a meeting with him uh, and, and pray for him during the pandemic, Amazing. he's open to hearing you. And uh, we had groups of, you know, we had a, a group of maybe 20 some uh, young apostolic leaders go in there and uh, prophesy over him. And he opened up his heart, you know, and, and he said, it's hard. I want to do the right thing. I can't, I, I don't always do the right thing. I have a good team behind me. Um, I, I've actually, during these last two years, developed strong relationship with his minister of human rights, who is a, a lady, wow. a woman who is a Pentecostal, uh, uh, up, has a Pentecostal upbringing, uh, but has a track history of fighting for the indigenous, fighting for uh, uh, the people that are uh, dis displaced in the Amazon region and fighting for the orphan and fighting for the wow. widow. I mean, so, and, and, and really looking at us and even to our church, like we'll get texts from her saying, hey, you know, could you ask for all the intercessors of Zion Church to just cover me in prayer right now? I'm going into the strategic meeting and we're talking about the Amazon and, and even the, the Western press hearing about all, the, all that's happening with the Amazon. I mean, I, wow. I know going out mostly to a Western uh, public, there are a lot, a lot of intentions behind just a, what seems to be a pure, you know, environmental agenda of saying we want Amazon being preserved. There, there is an intention of taking Amazon for selfish reasons. And of course, uh, the government has, of Brazil hasn't always done the best job in stewarding the Amazon region, but uh, there, there, there is an awareness of ulterior motives behind it, saying we want to take control of the Amazon so that we will preserve it. Uh, you know, it, it, and she will be inside those meetings texting us for prayer and, and, and asking, mm -hmm. can you ask for, 
for uh, for wisdom of the Lord for upon us. So I've I've met with the president a couple times. I've um, met with with her numerous times. We've covered them in prayer before, and just to see that we have you know this is an eye opener for me, Sean. Um, people are people, whether they be in power, whether they be in the king's palace, whether they be out you know in the slums, whether they be in their nine to five job. People are people. I I really understand that. At the end of the day, we are really needy of the grace of God. It's yep. very hard for us to, to judge. I, I, I'm, I'm a, a, you know, I, I, I am guilty of being somebody that judges quick. And uh, but once I've been pulled into those meetings in the presidential palace, and to see and hear them, and at times even the president weeping before me, and and offering, you know, we're offering prayer, and uh, and seeing this this man is just as much human as I am. And we're in the need of grace and uh, in need of wisdom. And I'll just leave this, you know, as we continue. Um, one of the key things that I've found, and this is going to sound a little bit odd, but I mean, you all understand what I'm trying to say, is that every time I'm in a, in a room with influential people, whether they be, you know, wealthy, multi-billionaire business people, whether they be uh, governors, the president himself, congressmen, uh, and I've been in numerous situations with with congressmen and senators. I'll, uh, you know, in my mind, I'm replaying this, and and I'm telling myself, "Tail, who's the most influential person here?" It's not about money. It's not about power or status. It's about the word of the Lord. Yeah. And and the truth of the matter, and the Bible will teach us that whether that be through the life of Joseph, whether that be through the life of Esther the life of Daniel and so many others, Nehemiah, so many others. Whoever has the word of the Lord is the most influential person in the room. Whoever has the rhema word of the Lord has the influence and the leverage inside the room. Yeah. And so I tell myself, you don't need to have that amount of money in your bank account because definitely I don't have that. You don't need to be a president or a senator or a congressman. What you need and what I've raised you to be is to have the word of the Lord. Now think Amen. about Nathan and David, right? Nathan did not have the military power that David had. Nathan did not have the anointing that David had in terms of as a worshiper. Be you know, it, it is not said of Nathan to be a man, you know, uh, uh, that that was of the Lord's heart. It's said of David to be that. But Nathan had the word of the Lord. Nathan did not have the authority over the land of Israel. Uh, uh, David had. But he had the rhema word of the Lord. So, so as I'm speaking to leaders that are being placed by the Lord in places of influence, if you are more impressed by the feast and the banquet that the king can host, and you under you forget why you're in that palace in the first place, you will just be one more. Wow. And I've told myself, yeah. I will not be just one more. How do I protect myself for being uh of, of being just one more poor, one more person that has been in the king's courts. When I am not seduced by the banquet, I am not seduced by the gifts, and I understand that my weapon is not to, true, to, to try to prove myself through human endeavors, but to just be, yeah. uh, you know, just yeah. be the, the, the voice of God in that situation, to be, yeah. you know, just that, that channel where his voice can come through. And that's the whole premise of this podcast is – really you know the 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 difference between principle led leadership and presence led leadership and the presence of god connected to the word of the lord stands out amongst every type of leadership and you know i love that i think you know i was actually going to say before you said that i was going to say that you know often we think of the most powerful person in the room is the one with the most power the most exactly. influence but actually yeah. The most powerful person in the room is the person that has the ear of the most powerful person in the room. Wow. And it's like Joseph had the word of the Lord, but had the ear of Pharaoh. Yep. Daniel had the word of the Lord, but had the ear of the kings that he served, King Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, all of these guys, they may have not have been the man, but they were in service to the man or they were, yes. they had the ear of the man that had the so-called worldly power. But in the end, it was those that had the word of the Lord that had the ear of the most powerful men or women in the room that actually had the most 
power. And I think that that really brings us back to the whole premise of the why we do this podcast is, you know, if you've if you've been tracking with us and you're listening, you know that like the first uh, probably at least 15 podcasts, we're talking about training ourselves to be supernatural representations of the kingdom everywhere we go talking about the voice of god understanding how to see understanding how to perceive what god is saying recognize what god is saying and i think this is what you're talking about i mean you 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 were trained you were you invested in yourself you had good mentors in your life and you were at a place where you were readied to be in these rooms so that when the president needs a word from God, you're actually already seasoned enough and prepared enough to jump on an opportunity like that and not be like, Oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. Like, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and the thing is, is like most leaders out there that are the most impacting world changing leaders out there actually feel like they don't know what to do, but they've learned to, in those moments, rely on the one who does. And, you know, God has a plan. He has a word in every situation. All we need to do is be willing to lean in. And when we lean in, we get a hold of what he wants to say. Now, let me ask you a question. So like, you know, know, you're in these, I know you have many stories around influencing, whether it's athletes, whether it's um, the entertainment, whether it's, I mean, I, and just by not even knowing some of these stories, just by being around you and even just at the send the last time that you were there or last time that I was there in Brazil, when you were leading the send yeah. and that charge on that, like seeing all these different celebrities come in and yeah. being a part of this massive movement, like just seeing the impact of the movement that you're a part of just speaks to me alone. Okay. It spreads beyond the four walls of the church. It's hitting business, hitting you know, politics, it's hitting media, it's yeah. hitting every area. What are some of the successes and failures you would say? Let's maybe go to failures for a second yeah. that you had to learn to get into these moments. Like, cause everybody wants a meeting with the president, everybody, yeah. you know, I'm going to influence Kings, you know, I'm going to influence yeah, exactly. presidential candidates and leaders. Yeah. And, and they have a desire to have marketplace it's genuine. Maybe there's yeah. some false motives, but it's genuine. Ultimately we want, we want to influence, you know, What are some of the failures maybe getting into that environment as a young overzealous leader and then actually journeying through the process to actually be someone that could be found in those rooms? Give me like some growth points. Like what did you have to learn? How did you adjust? Because obviously we want to throw out like certain language, certain churchy language, like there's practicals to influence. Give us some... What, what are some failure moments that we could glean from or learn from? Well, you know, I think that um, I'll, I'll give you some from our experience and some that we knew before and that uh, we were watching out for that. And that's why I feel we get, we were given favor. I would say from my experiences, you know, I, I assumed, I assumed that my church would know how to handle when celebrities would come into your service. I just assumed because it, it, it was so normal for us to, to really pray for, Lord, we want to see people that are shaping culture come here and listen to kingdom teaching and take kingdom values into their arts and their entertainment. That for us, it was just like, oh, check that out. Somebody's coming. And I'm not looking at, oh, that actress is here or that actor is here or that uh, athlete is here or that singer is here as something to say, wow, look at us, right? We're, we're looking as a leadership team saying, it's happening. The Lord is answering our prayers. The Lord is actually going to use us to influence them so that they, they would influence the masses. That, that was my thought. Now, I remember one time we had this uh, world-renowned soccer player visit our church, right? I mean, he's played, he was a star in, in, the, in two huge clubs in Europe. He was a star in my soccer team in Brazil which is the third largest fan base team in, in all nation. So it's like everybody would know him. They would know him if he was walking the streets in, in, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Italy, in, in, in Spain, in England. What about Canada? What about Canada? Uh, uh, probably, yeah, all the <laughs> soccer fans would know him. Yeah. And, and as we were doing service, I'm up there, right? And there is a moment where, you know, you, you've done that kind of stuff. Hey, just, you know, look at three, four other people around you. This is pre-pandemic years, right? So uh, look look at three, four people and just say, hey, 
tonight God's going to touch your life or something like that, right? And as I'm seeing the church mingle, I see three or four young people taking selfies with this guy in the middle of service. And I could see that he's this uncomfortable, wow. right? And, Cute. and he was uncomfortable. And later on, he reached out to me and he says, I don't think I want to go back there. I just wanted to go in and worship. Wow. Right? And so I'm thinking, wow, my leadership team knows how to deal with this. I have prepared myself to deal with this, but my church does not know how to deal with this. And if I want to put this, put them in a setting like that, um, I'm going to have to train my people. Now, I had two options. He asked me, can not you come to my house and do a service or, or conduct a service here? So then I can have other soccer players and other celebrities come and we can have our own service here. So I could have said yes to that, which I said no. Or I could have said, you know what? I'm going to take the long and hard route, but it will be the most sustainable route. I will teach my church how to, he how to deal with money, power, uh, with influence and fame, right? And so I said, listen, bro, we believe church we do services if on Sundays. I mean, I'm I'm super, you know, you know, I'm I'm flattered that you would have me come out of your church on a Tuesday night and we would have amazing dinner that you would have like, you know, an, a a world renowned chef out there cooking them for us and we would have all your friends out there and and I know it would be a powerful service, but if I do that, I am not really living what I believe the church is supposed to live. Right? right. So it it, it would have been like a shortcut yeah. And so I went on this thing of like, we are going to teach the church why we are here. What is the church? So it just took me on an ecclesiology journey. What is the church? What is kingdom? What does it mean to be uh, the ecclesia? What does it mean to be the kingdom ambassadors to culture, the kingdom ambassadors to education, to family? Right. And then, and what, what are the, 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 I would say the pitfalls for any Christian power, money, and sex. Are we going to deal with this? Because also, if we can yeah, it's deal a, with this. It's also a song. Remember that song? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can think of that. You said that. I'm like, Oh, it's a song. <laughs> it it is there. a song back in, back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, that, that's that's the pitfalls for any any believer. Yeah. And so we're going to address that, you know. Uh, so so we started seeing slowly fruit coming back. And then suddenly I saw um, it was maybe, you know, we started mentioning this in leadership teams. We started going through our small groups talking about these issues, not necessarily about that person. But suddenly I started seeing, you know, so then suddenly I would see hear people say, hey, that actor, he's here on service tonight. I'm on the front row, like maybe, you know, 15, min 15 minutes before I'm preaching. And an usher comes and says, hey, pastor, just so you know, so-and-so is here, so-and-so is there. I'm like, okay, cool, that's fine. And uh, I get up there and I'll do the mingle time and people are acting normal and they're comfortable, right? And we start seeing athletes show up back again. But it took us that guy for us mm -hmm. to understand our church is not ready to be dealing with influence. It's not about just you as a leader, but it's yeah. about your community. And, and, and maybe you're, you're listening to me right now and you're not a church leader like I am, like Sean is, but maybe you lead a company. Maybe you lead, I, I don't know, like a, a, a nonprofit. Maybe maybe you, you lead a business or, or, or a school or, a, you know, if we're believing to be influential people, what influential people need is to be treated normal and to be loved like anybody else. Yep. What they don't want is to be used. And anything that is a hint of being used repels influential people. Mm -hmm. No, it's so true. And, you know, I was just thinking about the fact that, you know, we pray for people of influence. And when we pray for people of influence, we open the door to have influence. I believe, believe that with all my heart. What we pray into, we actually open our lives up to receive. But then there's a practical side to it. It's like you could pray for Peter to get out of prison. But then when it gets out of prison, how do you handle it? How do you respond? Because that's what the they were doing. <laughs> Acts 12, they were praying for Peter to get out of prison. In a prayer meeting, Peter exactly. actually gets delivered from prison. They hear the knock at the door, and they don't even open the door. It's like they don't know how to handle now exactly. the prayer answered. So it's like, you know, you pray exactly. for influential pray people fun. to come to your church. They yep. come, and then you're not equipped yet strategically on how to 
manage it. So I see two things happening here. I see the, the one we need to pray into things to have influence over those things. And then two, there's also a strategic, practical, cultural development side, whether it's in business, whether it's in church, it's like, you can pray for your business to succeed and hit that, you know, uh, you know, hundred million dollar mark of revenue. But yes. then if you're not ready in systems and in infrastructure in st strategy to handle the hundred million dollar mark, it's going to crush you. Yeah, and exactly. the very thing that you prayed for will actually be the very thing that takes you out. So I see prayer, I see strategy. And I think you, you've, yes. you've kind of, you've lit, you've juggled both with, you know, building and establishing a movement, this movement called dunamis also then extending into your school, your dunamis, what you call greenhouse, which is yep. uh, uh, an online school. And also you do in-house like physical schools all around the world. And, um, you know, I see both the prayer and the strategy. You know, I was thinking about um, uh, a time just as you were talking about when I was, at a, I was actually speaking at uh, a clinic that yeah. does plastic surgery. And they brought me in to actually prophesy and minister to their staff, non-believing staff. They want me to bring, they're going to bring me in as like a, as a, a motivational type speaker. I'm not going to let them know what I do or who I am really. And I'm going to go in there. I'm going to move in word of knowledge and I'm going to prophesy over these, these staff members, like doctors, surgeons, lawyers, business people, and they're, and we're going to see God move and he would, and I've done it multiple times now and God's done amazing things. But there was this one time I went in and the owners of the clinic said at the very end, uh, when everybody leaves, we're going to invite this person in. We're not going to tell you who, who they are. I'm going to give you any warning about them. And we want you to, from like a non-biased clean slate, just ask God what he wants to say to them. And uh, interestingly enough, I did not know who this person was, never seen them before. And this person was directly connected to a very, 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 I mean, in marriage, uh, the, it was actually a, a woman who had a very, very, very influential husband. In fact, okay. one of the most Googled people uh, in the world. And wow. uh, I didn't know, I didn't know who she was. I didn't even know really this person actually that was the influential person, but I went in just clean <laughs> slate, didn't ask any questions. And we ended up prophesying and ministering to this individual for a good, like two and a half, three hours. Wow. And I find out during the middle to the end who this person was, and then kind of understood the gravity of it. And I'm just so thankful that they didn't tell me anything because sometimes even as people that have prepared ourselves, when we hear who yeah. we're about to meet, who we're about yeah. to influence, it can really jar the journey of just getting what God wants us to get and yeah, getting a true. heart yeah. that's un, like just the filter is just is pure, right? In that moment. And I think that the, the, these are the things that we're talking about wrestling. It's the strategic and it's the prayer. It's, and it's how do we balance the two and actually make the influence we want to make. Uh, I want to ask you a question as we close here, man. I want, I want, yeah. I want you to give... I want you to give like two or three, maybe two practical things that we can do in the next seven to 14 days for all those that are listening right now, those that are already making massive influence in the business world, government, education, family, media, or whatever sphere of society you find yourself in. And those that are on the journey that want to make more impact as a leader, give us a few things, maybe two, one or two things that we can do practically in the next seven to 14 days to, to think different and to position ourselves different and to make room for this be to begin to happen. Yeah, well, that's, that's awesome that you brought this thing up, uh, Sean. I think, you know, just a simple exercise, right? This is an exercise I, I, I began doing that has really stretched me. I ask myself, I try to put an actual value to my vision, right? And so I, I'll, I'll ask, as a, as a ministry, as dunamis, as, as, as a movement, or even Zion Church as a church, uh, what is the amount of vision that I have? Is it a million-dollar vision? Is it a $2 million vision? Is it a $10 million vision? Is it a, you know, I don't know, $100 million vision? Is it a billion-dollar vision, right? And, I mean, people are like, well, why do you ask that? Be because I say, well... If I have a $10 million vision, I want to just build 
another campus across town, or I want to build a, I don't know, like an ele a Christian elementary school, which amazing. Why am I praying for a billionaire to come into my church to partner with me? Because a billionaire, when he comes to partner with me, if he sees that his giftings, his resources aren't going to match your vision, he's wow. going to go to another place. Amazing. Right. And so uh, there's no use for you praying for a billionaire to come to your vision. If your vision is a millionaire vision, you need millionaires to come to your vision. So, so just to think that way in terms yeah. of a value will actually start gauging you and, uh, and, and it'll stretch you. So I've, I've actually stretched myself. I'm said, I said to myself, you know, we've been believing God for, uh, I don't know, $10 million. But if the Lord gave me right now, right now, $10 million, do I know what to do with $10 million? Do I have initiatives that will actually uh, use these $10 million in a responsible way? Right. Or, oh, hey, guys, I got $10 million. I'm going to gather my team and say, hey, what do we do now? Uh, hey, let's pray. Maybe we could build a studio. Maybe we could build a, a school. Uh, maybe we could do. No, 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 no. I need to ha I need to have a vision Good. ready for the, for the provision. Yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. so many times we, we want provision without vision. So I would say do that analysis. Take some time. All the leaders that are listening to me, you know, what is it that you're leading? A lot of times you're, you're, you're crying out, you're believing for resources that don't match your vision and start seeing if it's, if there's discrepancies it's amazing. and write that down on paper and, and, and just take it to the Lord in prayer and just ask the Lord, maybe I am being led by ambition, human ambition, mm. or maybe I, I'm just, I just don't have faith mm. and whatever the case is, make sure you tweak that and make sure you come into alignment. So that's number one. Now, Number two, I would also say, you know, write down what are the negotiables and non-negotiables when it comes to values. So I had one of my spiritual sons come to me and uh, he came to me maybe three, uh, two years ago. And he's saying, I want to start this company. Right. And um, uh, his wife is part of the company with him and, and she's a very gifted person. He said, you know what? She has a talent. I have the business mind. I'm going to come around. I'm going to structure it. And, and, and I said, all right, cool. That's, that's good. And you could tell the things was, I mean, you could tell the company was going to fly, right? I mean, it, it was going to take off. And, uh, I said, well, you know, listen, when this thing works, you will have to face fame. You're going to have to face money. You're going to have to face, you know, uh, a lot of women around you. So what are the pitfalls that you can already preview that they're going to happen so that you can make decisions right now before you are found inside a, a position like that? And so what are your negotiables? What are your non-negotiables? Mm. Uh, what if this company, uh, you're, you're going to have to, you have the possibility of having a lot of money invested that, but you are going to have to advertise this, 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 and that. What will you do? You know, so it's, it's like, oh, I'm not going to advertise, I, I don't know, tobacco. But, I mean, if they come with this amount of money to your table, is this a decision that you already made before they came? Or will you have to make a decision on the spot? Because if you're going to have to make a decision on the spot, the temptation is enormous, mm. right? If, if you made the decision before, you don't even take the call. You don't even, you don't even set the meeting. And so these are the things that I would say, you know, you need to think about these things. So right. as I advise presidents, governors, as I advise artists, athletes, what, what, what do I do here? It, so one of the things that I said to myself was, I will not go into this thing of having these meetings outside the church or else that's when, quote unquote, Christian bribe happens. Hey, you come here, you pray, you prophesy, I'll give you a Rolex. Because I've seen this film so many times. So like, no, 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 I'm, I need to build my church to be ready for this kind of thing. I'm going to have to build my leaders to be ready for that kind of things. I'm going to have to prepare my leaders to be faced in positions where they're going to be, quote unquote, in a very subtle way, bought into certain circles of influence. Yeah. So in, in a way, I'm going to have to armor them, bulletproof them, so to say. And so these are the things I would say, as awesome. people are beginning to think, I want to pioneer this. I want to, I want to, you know, I want to be an entrepreneur. 
I have this startup company. Well, make certain decisions before you find yourself in certain positions. That's awesome. That's awesome. So two takeaways for those of you listening. Number one, get the price tag for your vision. Write down the price tag for your vision. Is it a million dollar vision, a $10 million vision, a billion dollar vision? What is your vision worth? Because there's no provision without a vision. Exactly. Number two, number two, write down your values, write down, take some time over the next 14 days, write down your negotiables, like Teofilo said, and your non-negotiables, huge keys in the next steps of positioning yourself for greater influence. So this brings us to the very end of this episode. Thank you so much for listening. Just as we close, I want to make sure that everyone listening out there has an opportunity to not only follow what Teo is doing on social media, follow the movements that he's leading with Dunamis and even what he's doing in the church in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and even beyond. I want to encourage all of you to check out his incredible training and equipping school called Dunamis Greenhouse. Uh, if you can just tell us a little bit before we close today, Teofilo, like what is your school? What is this all about? How do people get involved? Well, you know, we, we've been having these schools uh, in Brazil and also in different nations of Europe. Uh, it's a bilingual school. It's uh, Portuguese or English. And uh, you could actually find us on Instagram at Dunamis Greenhouse. Dunamis with the I, not with the Y. Dunamis Greenhouse at Dunamis Greenhouse. And how do they follow you? How do they get in touch with you? What's the best place? I Instagram? I think it, Instagram. Uh, I'm on Instagram a lot. So at Teo, T E O Hayashi, H A Y A S H I, at Teo Hayashi. And I'm on the gram. Awesome. Yeah. So check him out on the gram. And from there, you'll be able to find everything else that he's connected to. And so I really want to encourage you to track with him. I know it will be a powerful tool for your leadership. Thank you so much again, man. Appreciate you tons. And for those that are listening, we'll see you next time.